it's no secret that NASA has been doing what many describe as the impossible since its origins. Now, NASA is looking to return humans to the lunar surface under, not for the first time, extremely unusually challenging circumstances, uh, from delays with HLS litigation, from issues with the spacesuits, uh, I mean, the COVID causing supply shortages, there, there seems to be no end to the obstacles that seem to pop up. How have you been leading NASA towards this literal moonshot goal through all of these challenges? Well, NASA is uh, an agency of overcomers. And uh, the proof's in the pudding. Look what's been accomplished in the past. Uh, and remember how long it took the Apollo program. Uh, and that was with 4% of the federal budget that was dedicated uh, to NASA. Uh, and now we're doing it with 1% of the federal budget. Uh, and, and yet NASA is uh, a bunch of people that are overcomers. They are can-do people. And no matter what the obstacle, we will get it done. We're not gonna fly until it's safe. And uh, there have been obstacles, but maybe it's uh, interesting why NASA has been voted nine years in a row as the best place to work in the federal government. And maybe it's uh, also why it was voted the, the best handling COVID of any U.S. government department. So we'll get it done. Definitely. Now, diving a little bit more into the specifics of even just the past few months, kind of the challenges that have been placed on not just NASA as an agency, but specifically the Artemis program, uh, you know, I know that NASA voluntarily uh, placed the delay on HLS uh, development um, surrounding that litigation and that that audit just came out about the spacesuits. What What is your response to things coming up like that? Obviously the public has a response, but what is your view on those two specific challenges? Space is hard. And if you're talking about the suits, uh, they've been uh, developed over the course of the last 10 years. Uh, it's a totally different kind of suit. And oh, by the way, it's not one or two sizes. It's gonna accommodate uh, a stature that is much smaller because we're going to be landing with the possibility of a smaller stature female for the first time on the lunar surface and possibly to Mars as well. So we're developing the spacesuit of the future. And uh, they've run into uh, delays in the course of that. But space is hard, and you often run into these delays. Definitely. Uh, now, kind of specifically on that spacesuit issue, uh, you know, kind of in looking towards 2024, if 2024 remains the steadfast, hard and set goal, what measures do you think NASA might take? to get to that goal and make sure that the spacesuits are ready, tested, and everything in time? Will there be commercial partnership that has not been in place before? Uh, will NASA reach out to companies interested in helping to make that happen? Well, uh, first of all, there are other things that could cause a delay other than the spacesuits. Uh, we've already seen the extended litigation. Uh, we don't know what the federal judge is going to require on this latest uh, to the Court of Claims. Uh, we have seen uh, the, the fact that uh, it's taken longer to get the SLS than we thought, and yet the SLS is being stacked as we uh, speak. And it is massive. And it is reasonable to expect that the SLS will launch at the end of this year, beginning uh, first part of next year. And, uh, and so uh, there's a combination of everything, not just the spacesuits that you're looking at. Certainly the human lander uh, is another thing. Uh, so, uh, and yet 
we're going to go on a timetable that I'm going to insist is we don't go until it's safe. Now, remember, you you all keep asking, well, is it going to be 2024? No, it's going to be 23. Remember, we are going to fly humans to the moon at the end of 23 or the early part of 24. It's going to be a lunar orbit, and then it's going to come back, and it's going to have two astronauts, one an American, one a Canadian, and that will be in preparation then to go to Artemis III, which will be the first uh, human landing in the Artemis program. Uh, you know, I know that everyone's asking about 2024 specifically as a year, but, you know, in your own words, NASA doesn't go until it's safe to go. So, you know, judging from what we've seen this past year and how NASA is faced with these obstacles, but overcoming them, do you think there is a possibility that that timetable might be pushed, you know, with the expectation of safety first always? I can't answer your question because I don't know. That's fair. <laughs> That's totally fair. Now, shifting gears just a little bit, uh, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll press on that a little more later. But shifting gears a little bit, you know, looking to the future of the International Space Station. Uh, earlier this morning, you spoke of the space station and kind of looking forward to 2030. I have kind of a two part question. Do you think it's possible that the space station will push past 2030 and then following that kind of tentative, you know, timetable, time frame. Uh, how do you foresee commercial involvement in the space station? And as you mentioned this morning, the possibility of commercial space stations popping up in LEO? Well, we already have uh, commercial involvement in the space station. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good bit of commercial involvement, and that's another reason to extend it, to continue that commercial uh, participation and to get the commercial industry to where it becomes attractive to them to set up their own space station. So uh, the year 2030, uh, understand that I have a history on this as Senator. Ted Cruz and I passed this in the NASA bill uh, three years ago, and then that bill was not passed in the Senate for a completely different reason. It was. It was attached to a big omnibus bill and for some reason other. Uh, so it's been the intent in particularly the Senate to extend it to 2030. Now, I believe uh, since I've been here for a few months uh, that the White House uh, later on in a short period of time will be coming out and issuing a statement on this. And I expect it to be a supportive of 2030, because that gives you another nine years, eight and a half years, uh, in order to get the commercial companies ready to take over low Earth orbit with a commercial station or stations and other activities where they are actually doing profitable enterprises. Definitely. Now, obviously, NASA has a pretty significant presence with the International Space Station. Currently, in this future, if, you know, after the space station is retired, these commercial space stations pop up in low Earth orbit, how do you foresee NASA's role in working with them, you know, through launch, uh, through, through scientific research? How do you see that relationship evolving? Well, just as I said, it is evolving right now. Uh, and uh, so everything that the commercial stations are learning and the experiments that they're conducting and the manufacturing that they are doing in research capacity is preparing them to take over. So that then that allows NASA to basically get out of low Earth orbit as you go into the decade of the 30s so we can concentrate on going to Mars and our operations around the moon as we are getting prepared to go to Mars. Absolutely. Now, shifting gears again just a little bit, uh, this morning you spoke about kind of U.S. political relations and NASA, and you mentioned that you hope that one day 
NASA and China could form some kind of partnership. Could you speak a bit more to that? Yes, it takes two to tango. Uh, and so China has to be willing. I think we are willing. Uh, and I'm mindful of the law that says that we can't do business with them unless I certify that it does not in any way harm national security. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, you've got to have a, a transparent relationship with your partner. Uh, and uh, thus far, China has not been forthcoming, not only on that, but other things as well. Definitely. Uh, now, again, just this morning, you, you spoke quite a bit to the relationship between not just NASA and China, but NASA and Russia as well. Um, and you seem very confident in NASA and Russia's ongoing and continued cooperation in space. I am. Yes. Um, but you did express concern with the kind of space race that has emerged with China. And I'm curious if you could speak a bit more to the specific concerns you have with China. Well, the, the Russian experience, the old Soviet experience, is to show you that two military enemies can become friends in civil space. And that has been demonstrated amply since 1975. My goodness, that's 40 plus, 40, 45 years. Uh, so uh, that's what I would hope with China. But there's been no indication uh, thus far. Possibly uh, we can do things like deconfliction uh, of space assets and space junk. I certainly hope China has learned their lesson in 2007 when they tested their ASAT and blew it to smithereens and put tens of thousands of pieces of junk up there that threaten other assets, including humans. Uh, but uh, it would be it would be my hope that we would have a cooperative civil uh, space program with China. Yeah, and by the way, uh, when they flew their first Taikonaut, he came to see me. Really? Uh, yeah, we had a nice uh, meeting in uh, in my Senate office at the time because that was years ago, and lo and behold. Who comes by the office while he's there? It's Buzz Aldrin. So, I mean, that Taikonaut's day was made when he got to meet uh, the number two man on the moon. Now, China has a good and a very aggressive program. Just look at what all they've done recently. And also, they tell you what they're gonna do. They're gonna put three landers on the South Pole they said they're coming and they're gonna land with humans on the moon. And sometimes they surprise you because they don't tell you everything. And so, voila, they put up a space station and then it doesn't take too long that they suddenly put up Taikonauts. Uh, I hope we can cooperate. I hope so. Otherwise, it's a space race. Yeah. Uh, I, I just have time for one more, um, but you spoke a bit about space junk, uh, and especially here at Symposium, it's very clear that there are more satellite operators and companies and startups than ever. How do you see not just U.S. policy, NASA policy, U.S. law, but you know, kind of across the board, international regulations surrounding satellites in low Earth orbit changing so that you know we can kind of get ahead of the space junk problem as more companies want to launch more satellites? Well, the atmosphere becomes our friend because you can get rid of the space junk by burning it up on re-entry. And then if a part or parts survive, that's why you want to have as a requirement that whatever you put up and it must come down that you control the re-entry so that human population is not threatened and property. 
And uh, uh, so uh, we have seen uh, some nations that have been irresponsible in that regard recently. And of course, the uh, first stage of the Chinese uh, rocket that put up the uh, space station was a good example of that. We didn't know where it was coming down. Uh, and they wouldn't talk to us. And fortunately, uh, on that last orbit, uh, it went into the Indian Ocean, but we thought at one point it might go into Greece or into Italy or somewhere in the Mediterranean that could have threatened stuff. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Have uh, a space asset that when it's ready to bring it out of orbit, you control it. Definitely. Thank you so much, Administrator. Okay.